And a good afternoon and a good evening, wherever you may be around the world. Thank you for joining the IO Tahoe online webinar. This is a live event. Uh, I'm Steve Friedberg from MMI Communications, and joining me for this webinar, which is, which is called Deconstructing Data Complexity, the case for AI-driven smart data discovery, is Charles Araujo, who is the Principal Analyst at Intellix. Charlie, how are you, sir? I am great and happy to be here with you, Steve. Thank you very much. We're glad you're here as well. Um, we're going to go over this. There's your speaker bio, just so you know. And for those who are not familiar with you, Charlie, you are an author. You have been quoted by just about every major publication out there. And you are the principal analyst with IntelliX. Can you tell me just briefly how, what IntelliX does, how it may be different than some of the other analyst firms that we may be familiar with? Sure. So uh, we, we like to call ourselves a, a boutique analyst firm, which really just means we're small. <laughs> but um, we focus on, I, I think mo what makes us most different than other analyst firms is that it, we aren't focused on specific sectors of technology. We really look at the market holistically and are focused on what we call agile digital transformation, which we really define as anything disruptive targeted at the enterprise. And so as a result, we cover a huge swath of the technology landscape with uh, data, big data analytics all being a part of that. So uh, we can, I can certainly go into more of, as we through, go through the conversation, but uh, in a nutshell, that's it. Yeah, I was going to say, I think this is definitely in your sweet spot, what we'll be talking about today. Uh, so that we know, quick matter of logistics. If you have any questions, there is a chat panel on the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Uh, if we have time to get to them, we would be delighted to do so. If you have any questions, feel free to chime in. Subsequent to this conversation, and it is going to be more of a conversation than a, a formal webinar, uh, you can pick up a copy of the recording at no charge from io-tahoe.com forward slash webinars. Don't forget to put the hyphen in there. Also, this slide presentation will be available for download at the same point. And of course, we would welcome any comments that you may have on Twitter using hashtags like AIML, Data Discovery, and also linking to us at, at IO Tahoe, no dash. So with that in mind, we've got the agenda going for today, and you can see the key points there, five major areas that I think we'd like to cover in the brief time that we have together, ranging from the data discovery dilemma all the way down to making the case for AI-powered data discovery. And so if we get started on that point, we have the data discovery dilemma. And Charlie, as I was going through these slides, I, I thought there was a bit of a disconnect here because the first point is data is out of control, but that's a great thing. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, so so first of all, I mean, I think that if you're in enterprise IT, that the first part of that statement, the data is out of control, is probably, you know, obvious and hard to refute. I, it, it's funny, I just posted this on my personal Facebook page, a uh, a picture of of the, these guys. It's this whole uh, like a, a warehouse and this truck, and they have get these pallets and this whole team of people pushing this huge box, this huge crate up this ramp. And it was a five megabyte hard drive delivered by IBM to a customer back in like the 1950s. I mean, it it, it is really only you know this a very recent thing that we've had a the amount of storage and and but even more than that the the wealth of data that has come. I mean, even less than 20 years ago now, or about 20 years ago, I was involved in a data warehouse project in healthcare. And I mean, if I think of what the amount of data we had then versus the amount of data that organizations are dealing with today, it is just astronomically different. And it's not just, I mean, I think that people are talking a lot about, you, you move uh, slide there, Steve, but um, it's not just that, that people are talking about, uh, you know, things like IoT, that is causing um, you know this explosion of data from the standpoint of all these devices out there kicking off all this data. That's certainly a huge chunk of it. You know, there's the smart cars and planes that are you know now all sensor driven, um, and everything has you know is kicking off all this data. Um, but it's also about just the fact that we are instrumenting everything. I mean, every at, at both the transaction level. Um, as well as from a, uh, you know, the, the, the automation of business processes across every dimension. I, I wrote an article recently about data-driven management and this idea that we're actually collecting data um, 
about how almost every facet of every part of the business is being done in any organization. And so there's just a flood of data. But the reason I say that's a great thing is that what it really comes down to is that that data across all of those dimensions across that entire spectrum is going to be the fuel that powers, in my opinion, everything that is to come. And I guess that's what we'll be talking a little bit about today. But but that's why, to me, it's a it's a really good thing for the enterprise. The better, the more data, the better. Yeah. Well, it, and getting to the second point there on the slide, that it's strategic. Uh, the the conventional wisdom, if you will, is that data is perhaps a company's most valuable, most strategic asset. I think that you said you'd be willing to go a little bit further than just that one point. Yeah, well, I, I mean, so I think cer certainly data is now strategic, and I think it is it, it is a critical asset. I, I, I think the, the most, I mean, it, in some cases, there is the actual monetization of data where data itself becomes a monetizable asset and or something that you can sell and take to market. Um, not always with good results, you know, exhibit a Facebook, right? But the, I think more than that, though, what data really is, is it's this um, fuel that powers the transformation of business models, which is where I think the, the primary driver of value is going to be in the forward, right? So I have this, I have this fundamental belief that we're in the midst of this, this transformation of the way organizations operate. And it's about shifting power to the customer, the, the value being driven by the customer. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, right? But by the experience. And that means in order to deliver that experience, I need to transform the way I operate, transform the business model itself. And in almost every case, I can't do that if I don't have the data, right? Everything that we now think about, if, and I won't name them, but pick your example. I guarantee when you think about the new way that business is being done, there's some company or some experience that comes to mind. And if you look just one little, you know, one to scrape the surface a little bit, what you see underneath that is that it's all driven by data. And so it's, it's about having this, this rich source that you can then transform business models around and then and it keeps going from there. But, but it just means that having this data is a strategic asset and it's a strategic imperative really about how you leverage that. So if you had this, this strategic use of data, which leads to, and I, and I have to confess, as I saw this slide for the first time, I thought, oh, good grief, the cognitive enterprise. <laughs> I, you know, let's, let's be very honest. There are a lot of terms out there that people will tend to roll their eyes at. But there's a background to this that makes sense. I mean, this is more than just another, for want of a better term, buzzcronym. Yeah, well, uh, the, the good news, I, at least for now, maybe that I'm not hearing a whole lot of people use this term. People are talking about AI a lot, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But the, uh, I, I think that the here, here's the fundamental premise, I guess, of what this means, is that as we move forward and we have more and more data, then organizations are going to continually automate anything and everything that they possibly can. And increasingly, what we're going to see, and we, you know, we, it's, it, you can see the first inklings of this in some of the high-profile Watson efforts and um, others. And, and you know, they're not they're not perfect examples insofar as they took a whole bunch of bunch of heavy lifting, and and they're not really sustainable today. But they were a great kind of proof of concept of how this is going to start evolving, and that as this data becomes a available. B, we're able to manage it and you know know what what the heck we have and and what it represents. And then as we start transforming business models, this idea of the rise of the cognitive enterprises is, is effectively an enterprise that is driven not only by data, but by systems, intelligent systems that sit on top of that data and leverage it to actually automate most of the transactions that occur within the business. And so it, it represents to me an actually a very fundamental shift. Um, in terms of how organizations are structured, managed, and led. Um, you know, if we look at the industrial age, it was all based around this idea of the supply chain. And I think when we start looking into the digital era, or the, whatever you want to call this time that we're now entering, this idea of the cognitive enterprise is really just this idea that the, the new industrial company, right? That it's not driven by the supply chain. It's driven by experiential value and data. But isn't that going to make it a lot tougher as you move forward, more data, more data, more data, which goes back to the final point on this page, that data complexity will increase exponentially. It, things used to be a lot simpler, all right? And, and now it just seems like we're heading down that slippery slope, that this is really going to be, well, 
I'll, I'll use the word explosion, but it may be greater than that. Yeah, no, this is this is um, it's it's going to be tough. It's it, it's it's tough already. It's going to get tougher. I, I was giving a speech in Saudi Arabia about a year ago, and I asked who here in the audience was you know we're CIOs, and we probably had about five hundred people in the audience, and you know maybe a third of them raised their hand, and and I said, and who here wants their job? And it was you know nobody raised their hand. It was dead silent. It was crickets, and it got a good laugh. And it was laughing, you know, partially because nobody wants to say they want their boss's job. But but the reality is, it's a horribly hard job today. I mean, as it's not just data complexity, right? Because that data is coming from this incredibly complex web of infrastructure, applications and infrastructure that sit below it, that is both capturing, managing, and serving up this data. And the entire technology stack is getting just exponentially complex. And so... It, it is necessary. It's a good thing. But but yeah, if you're an IT person, it's going to make your job harder and it's going to continue to get harder as time goes on. Which then begs the question as we go to the next slide that, okay, let's all go on buzzword patrol here. Uh, with AI, the enterprise savior, I think that if you're in computers, if you're in IT, you can't go up an hour, let alone a day, without hearing how AI and ML is going to solve this problem or that problem, right down to taking the cat out for a walk in the morning or something of the <laughs> sort. Uh, how about that for a cheap analogy, right? So, yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, it is, I think that, that when we look at this complexity, I mean, it, it's not like we're the first people to be talking about this. This is a well-understood issue that that this complexity problem, and it's manifesting itself across the entire spectrum of, of IT operations, of development, of you, you name it, every part of IT, every part of the enterprise really is struggling with this issue. And so uh, or, organizations are definitely on the hunt for ways to resolve it or ways to respond, and technology companies dutifully are showing up with with solutions. And in many cases, it is, we, we have this hype that all of this um, talk about the answer is AI, the, the answer is machine learning. And as in most cases, the the kernel of it is true, right? There There is a whole lot of truth to that. In fact, I'd argue that you're not going to be able to solve this problem without A, using technology, but very specifically without using some form of, of machine learning or artificial intelligence. But that said, it, you know, I think all of the the hype around, hey, this is, you know, plug it in, turn it on, and all your problems go away, is just that. It's it's um, it's hype. And so I think it's about, um, and unfortunately, I think that the downside to that is it causes um, enterprise leaders in particular to get, you know, really, they, it's the boy who cried wolf kind of scenario, right, where they start tuning it out because they get, you know, beat over the head with all this hype. The early adopters went in and realized it was nowhere near reality. And so you kind of have this, it, 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 uh, it was a little bit of a, of a you know, what do you, what do you call it? You know, is struggling with, with uh, just kind of having buyer's remorse. There we go of, of going down that first road. And so I think it's, it's caused a little bit of a hangover and, and well, it's it, now about how do you resolve it? Yeah. I was going to say that, that this is not new in that respect. The, the entire technology industry right. has been littered with this, uh, though the next great thing, which proved ultimately not to be the next great thing. So let's put, AI and machine learning in its place. What is the proper place? How should companies regard this today and how should they be looking at it for the future? Yeah, yeah, no, ab absolutely. I mean, we, we are, we have, I think I mean, the tech industry in particular has a, you know, horrible track record of, you know, uh, of going through these hype cycles of, of, you know, hype, 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 and then what? And, and the, in some cases, they're, they're nothing. They're just a term. In the case of AI and machine learning, I, I part of my frustration has been in talking with some enterprise executives, especially early on, it was that they were being dismissive. And and I think that's a shame because this this is the real deal, but it is a matter of putting it in its place, so to speak. And 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 here's where it comes down to let's I think specifically let's deal with the machine learning aspect of this. Is that where and, and maybe how it collides with the, this exploding data complexity issue is that the, the the thing that humans are great at are connecting dots that aren't necessarily obvious, right? And, and if, if you look at where computers struggle and things like um, uh, looking at pictures and analyzing that, that can be a really hard, you know, we're, they're getting better at it, but that can be very difficult for where, you know, a baby can figure this out, right? 
But where computers excel and where humans are often have struggle is identifying these patterns in data that may not be obvious. And, and that is, is partially just a function of the fact that we as humans can't process that much data that fast, especially when it's this voluminous type of, of streaming data or whatever it might be. And so machine learning is, is phenomenal at taking all of this massive amount of data and, and going through it and identifying the patterns that we can't otherwise identify. And then as it identifies those patterns, connecting the dots between you know, what, what are the correlations around that? And so I was going to say both the data that, you know, as well as as the data that you don't even know, the so-called dark data that's out there in your organization. Well, almost, almost better at that. I mean, I think, you know, the, as we move from structured to unstructured data as a core driver of, of, you know, how we're looking to create value, it's the structured data, especially legacy structured data, we have more experience with, we know more of what we're looking for. It's easier, therefore, to identify those patterns, but it is in this unstructured and dark data, these other elements that having tools like machine learning are just masterful at identifying patterns. And, and you know, when we talk to enterprise executives or enterprise leaders, we routinely hear that these are the successful use cases um, where they apply this and it's like, oh, wow, we didn't even know that existed. We didn't know, you know, we never would have found this relationship. We never would have understood that this, this was connected to that. Um, and that's the stuff that machine learning is is great at, and it, and even more than that than that, it's that's where so much of the work has been done over the last decade or so. So we're seeing maturity in these technologies where they are reliable and you can count on them. I was going to say, I remember when I started in the business and you wanted to analyze the database, you couldn't analyze the database. You couldn't mine it. You had to take a core sample and hope that you found the patterns. Right. Now, obviously, the cost has come down, and as the cost has come down, people said we can store more, and now they're storing everything because they can. Yeah. So no, how- that, that, that's a great, great point, right? And, and I think that um, you know, part of that explosion of data that we talked about at the beginning is exactly that. It's economics, is that the cost of data, the, the, the relative um, ability to overcome some of both the compute storage, data gravity issues, all of that, is making it um, not only easier, but then you have that other side of the imperative of it. So these are colliding where we are now saving everything and you're able to apply it in a way that we simply didn't. In fact, you know, I, I, I do not consider myself a machine learning AI expert, but I was talking to some folks um, that I would, that are experts about it. And, and one of the things we were discussing is the fact that in many ways, the whole AI machine learning space sort of stagnated because the, the theory was so far ahead of the, the technology in terms of our ability to have compute and storage enough to actually put the stuff into practice. And so, you know, I think we're going to see a, this explosion of, of AI in particular um, as, as we're now moving past that stage where now suddenly our compute and our storage capabilities are, are matching, um, you know, where it's at. And so I think we're going to see a continue, continual rapid evolution of it. But uh, I think as we apply this to data, Specifically, it's going to be critical because you have all this data out there and it is both the fuel that powers machine learning and powers AI, but it's also a great target for it because you have to make sense of all the data before you can do it. So it, it, it's this kind of cyclical um, intertwined thing. And, and, and to take it one step further, which goes to the last point on this slide, when, when we say AI, there's almost an automatic assumption we're talking big data these massive amounts of data, you're suggesting perhaps otherwise. Uh, well, well, certainly it applies to big data because big data is where you right. have the pattern recognition challenges, right? And in these massive data sets, it's really difficult to sort through all of that to find the patterns. But I think, A, there are just as many undiscovered patterns that might exist in the traditional data sets. And even more importantly, it's the correlations and relationships between the traditional data sets and these new big data unstructured data sets. Um, and, and that, because it's, I, I think one of the, maybe the fallacies that when this whole big data thing, in fact, I wrote an article about this as well, was that it was just go collect the data and all your problems were going to go away, right? We we're going to, we, the whole, uh, um, you know, data lake movement started with this idea where it's like, just capture it all, throw it all in here and, and we'll worry about it later sort of a thing. And, and the problem is that that didn't actually lead to outcomes that were meaningful. And so it's really about 
focusing on the action, the, the results you're trying to achieve. What do you want to do with this data? And what you start finding when you do that is, is that that data can come from anywhere. It could, it could be these massive data sets that are coming from IoT devices or whatever. And it, you know, but more likely, it's a combination of this kind of historical legacy data sets you had, this new data you're capturing, partners, you know, data that's coming from partnerships or other relationships you have. And it's really about the interconnection, the intersection of all of that, that the greatest value um, is, is really to be found. And so it's about applying this everywhere. Okay, so at this point, I'm just going to remind folks that you are listening to an IO Tahoe online webinar with uh, Charles Araujo, who is the principal analyst at Intellix. And as we move to the next slide here, I had to laugh again when I saw this because, again, back in my days, uh, when we started out with big data or whatever we called it then, data mining, uh, the whole concept was that you needed an answer to a question. And you would take that question and you would send it up the mountain to the graybeards at the top of the mountain. And they would hem and haw and they would get you an answer back just in time for you not to be able to do a darn thing with the answer because <laughs> right. things had changed, right? Obviously, as things move faster, this is where, as you call it, the self-service imperative comes into play. And companies are moving faster than ever before because they have to move faster than ever before. Yeah, you know, it, it's absolutely right. I mean, the, um, I, I, like I mentioned, this data warehouse project I worked on back 20 years ago in healthcare, and, and it's exactly what it was, uh, that it was this massive process of, if you wanted information, and, and we had an entire team of people that his whole job was to, A, you know, build and maintain the data warehouse, but then also to respond to these requests. And it's, um, I, I think that there's been this recognition in the last, I'll say a couple of years, that that type of an approach was just not going to be sustainable. The, the problem is, is, is that leap is the easy one, meaning the, the leap to recognize that we need to get the access to the data as close as possible to the people who need it. That, that's a relatively easy. It makes sense, right? I mean, I think there's some people that maybe still have a kind of a, a fear of, of exposing that data. And, and there, there are other governance issues and there's security issues and there's lots of challenges with that. But frankly, I think that the biggest holdup has been just the complexity of doing that, of, of making that available in some way. Um, but to your point, the, I, I don't think that organizations have a choice any longer. The, the market is moving too fast. Customer expectations are changing too rapidly that organizations have to be able to pivot, adapt, be agile. And the only way that's going to happen, if we go back to the you know, premise from a couple of slides back at the beginning of the conversation, as data is the driver of value, or the enabler at least, of value, then we have to get access to that data to be able to know how to pivot, to know where to, how we're going to transform the experience or how we're going to tweak our business model. Without that data, we're not going to be able to function. And if, if we elongate the period of time it takes from the point of someone asks the question, the time we can give them the answer, the longer that is, the more unresponsive an organization becomes and the more they're going to lose in the market. And so it's about shrinking that time. And that means you have to find ways to expose the data to your consumer of that data, which, which may actually be a customer or more likely a business user who is using it to, to execute some kind of a, of a change or work in a business process, that that yeah. becomes the imperative. You see, I'm, I'm going to challenge you on one point because it, it, there was a theory about the principle of least access, and companies for the longest time said, oh, you don't need that information, frontline worker. Therefore, we're not going to give it to you. Well, things have changed, and those companies that have enabled in more information to frontline workers and others can move more nimbly, more rapidly, and get more accomplished. And that has been a fundamental change in the way companies think. So if we're looking at that, it's not only the additional data, but it is this digital experience, the whole realm of it, really, as you put it, that drives business value. Yeah, well, I'm not sure where the challenge was. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. The, you know, I, I will say that I think part of, the, part of the, the issue 
is that, and there's uh, maybe we'll take a half step back here and talk about a, a much more fundamental trend, right? It, and that is that the industrial age was built around what I'll call the linear business model. It, fundamentally, it was about this idea of having a supply chain in which we took a mass product designed for a mass market and delivered it through this supply chain as efficiently as possible. And that, that encompassed everything from the actual production and delivery to things like marketing and sales. It was all about optimization of that delivery supply chain. And so that really talked, the, the driver there for was that optimization, which meant it was about um, uh, how you removed variance from the process. And you know everything's like Six Sigma were all based around this idea of eliminating variance and that meant eliminating options, right? The whole idea of if you don't need this data, it's because I had, I had this very carefully crafted linear process that said this is how we function. And therefore, I could define exactly what data was necessary to execute that. The, this whole idea of the shift in the digital experience is, be, is that that has been turned upside down. We've moved from linear, synchronous business processes to multidimensional, asynchronous business processes because the customer is now in control. And the easiest way to think about this is, um, Jason, the president of Intellix, gives this example of the airport as a, just a, a very visceral way to understand this. Is that you know, if you go back just a few years ago, really, there was this very defined process that you had to follow to you know, execute the process of air travel because you had to go buy your ticket through a travel agent, um, or maybe you know, eventually you could buy it online, but then you had to go check in. And you know, but now think of it the way mobile has transformed this, right? We now choose a whole number, a whole bunch of this process. So the, the maybe the big building blocks are still there, but we change, we choose a whole bunch of how we check in, how we, you know, all these different options that we have. So if you try to build a process map around that, it looks like spaghetti. And so that that this is really what's happening is this idea of the digital experience is one in which the customer, the partner, and the employee, whoever they are, is the one that is 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 really driving the way that everything works. So, so having this idea of this linear structure where I can precisely define exactly what they're gonna need and when is thrown out the window. And so all the way back about exposing data, I don't, it, it, from a self-service standpoint, the reason self-service becomes so critical is that I don't really know what data they're gonna need. I, you know, as we start dealing with this, this, these constantly changing business models and these constantly changing experiential constructs, then what data they need to do their job is going to change day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. And if I have to try to predict that, then the whole thing falls apart. And so it is about enabling these experiences. And that really means creating as much flexibility as you possibly can. Yeah, it almost sounds like uh, the, the difference between agile and waterfall development almost. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it, it's, it, it's an interesting point. Um, and I'll challenge for those developers that are listening in on this, is that uh, I think people often misunderstood. Agile is not, I mean, it's about going fast, but it's not about speed per se, right? It's about iteration and about that flexibility. And that, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are quote unquote doing agile and really all they're doing is fast waterfall, right? And so making that jump of recognizing that it's about the asynchronicity of it, um, about not having this linear pre- prescribed flow, that's what starts changing your perspective. And it, it, it applies so dramatically to data, right? It, that we have to basically take all of this, massage it, control it, manage it, secure it, but then expose it so that our customers, our partners, our employees have access to the data that they need to do whatever it is that they need to do. So the the, the last point on this page, as I read it, something leaped into my mind. You say delivering value by getting out of the way. Now, Charlie, as you talk to C-level executives and you talk to other directors, VP levels, is there a, a sense that to some extent they don't want to get out of the way, that they like having that control? They, they may have to in order to do business more competitively and more effectively, but do they almost miss the days when they could control what happened and when and how? So at least to the executives that I spend most of my time talking to, no. Um, I think that, that there's been a pretty significant – the old school IT executive, you know, the, the CIO of yesteryear, I think they've mostly washed out. I think the executives, uh, particularly within large companies that I interact with today, they get this. They are incredibly business-focused. 
and they recognize that they have to do whatever they need to do to serve their customers and to enable the, all this transformation that we're talking about, you know, digital transformation, transformation of business models, all of it. And so uh, I don't think this is a, this is a problem um, at the executive level. I think it, where it's, here's where the challenge is, though. Um, it's more of a problem as you get deeper into the organization because the people deeper in the organization that are responsible for securing and governing that data, they're the ones that are left holding the bag, right? So if you, if you just exposed all your data out there willy-nilly and didn't deal with the governance, compliance, and security issues, uh, yeah, sure, our, our employees and our customers and, and our uh, partners might have great unfettered access to the data they can do amazing things with, but guarantee that you're going to have all kinds of problems. You probably even end up in jail, right? I mean, so that, that's not really an option. And so the, the message here is not that we just give it all up. The message is that you have to find a way to strike the balance where you're giving access to that data, but you are still managing effectively and, and now in this case, optimizing for how you deal with the governance, security, and compliance issues because they, they are still very real. And so, you know, the message here is, is that, yes, you need to get out of the way in so far as the, the over constriction of access, but you still have to do it in a way that you're dealing with these very, very real issues. Um, and, and, you know, let's face it, there's, there's the, the legal aspects of it, the regulatory and compliance type stuff, but there's also just the PR aspect of it, um, you know, the, the, where you're dealing with how the public is reacting to the use of this data. So it's a very touchy subject. And, and requires a, you know, a, a very, um, I think, a, a nuanced approach to how it's done. But, but the big message here is we just, IT has to get out of the business of saying no and instead recognize that this has to happen. And so now it's a question of how do we make it happen and still deal with these issues. So moving on. We, we've already covered the first point that complexity is no longer bad. I mean, you said it's going to increase exponentially. Oh, when you say it drives differentiation, does that imply that there are companies out there that are dragging their feet, being Luddites to some extent, or just being just taking too much of a time to say, I'll wait to see how others do it before I pull the trigger? Well, well, let me step back a little bit. So, so you know, first of all, I, you know, I, I want to talk here either to the executives or we're going to talk a little bit to, you know, if you're talking to an executive. But from an executive perspective, I think that um, I, I don't know that every executive right now is, is on board with this idea that complexity isn't bad, meaning that most of us, and I'll put myself, I, I ran technical operations for a, this billion dollar healthcare firm 27 years ago and have spent most of my career on the buy side advising enterprise executives. So I mostly see myself kind of in that light. And most of us came to age, so to speak, professionally, when we went through these cycles. And the cycle was that there would be a period of experimentation because we had business problems we needed to solve and we'd bring out a bunch of technologies and whatever. And then because it was all about optimization, it became too expensive to manage that way. So we would rationalize and standardize. So you would go look at all the different stuff you have and you would you would say, I need to remove complexity so that I can reduce my management overhead. And we would do that. We would pick a couple platforms. We would rationalize out, standardize everything. That would be this big old project. And then a new business need would happen and the process would start all over again. And that has been the cycle. And the, the big the, when I said this big shift, the complexity is no longer bad. What I'm really talking about is that I believe that cycle has come to an end that this idea that we go through this period and then we rationalize and standardize, I don't think it's happening anymore. And the reason is because the needs of, of any good sized organization are now so complex that the only way we can drive differentiation, the only way we can create business value using our technology is by leveraging this, this vast swath of the, of the technology landscape. And that means that ironically, and and so this is sort of a play that it's not so much the complexity that drives differentiation, but it's that the technology is driving differentiation and it is now outweighing the cost of the complexity. So the fact that if I can effectively have this incredibly complex environment so that I can deliver all these nuanced little needs to create differentiation in the market in small and big ways, but still manage my operations effectively and efficiently that's what gives me a competitive edge. 
because those organizations that can't, because because it does, you know, as much as the customer today, and we all are the are all of these consumers. While we expect all of this, we also still expect our stuff to work, you know. And so if if you can't deliver, if that complexity is causing you to break down and have failures, um, then then you're going to pay a, a a heavy heavy price for that. And so if if the choice comes down to well, in order to maintain stable operations that I have to remove complexity, then I lose. And so th that's what this really means. That complexity is driving differentiation or complexity is driving value because it's my ability to manage and sustain this highly complex environment um, that is going to drive that. And, 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 you know, I'm actually, we're talking specifically today about data complexity, but it's really every element of this. I think the specific thing about data complexity, though, is that um, data complexity is one of those things that can grow un, you know, unfettered because there is there is so much data and there's so many different systems um, and you know so little standardization um, around you know how how we structure data schemas and all of this that that the data complexity can be one of the most un, unwieldy issues that an organization has to deal with. So you know it's those that can get this right are the ones that are able to drive that value in the market. And today, how many of them are getting it right? I mean, of, the ten, of any 10 companies you speak to, how many get it? How many don't? Or how many are throwing their hands up and saying, help me on this? Oh, wow. That's a tough question. I, you know, I would, say, I would say 8 out of 10 get it from the standpoint that they understand what, uh, what I just said. Um, and I would say that they are, there is an openness to looking for ways to solve the problem. I, I think that the, the challenge really has been that if you look at the the technology stack of, of the modern enterprise, it, it has just gone through this massive transformation in the last decade in terms of like you know all this data being captured and all this new stuff. But but the you know the the legacy, the underpinnings uh, of that stack are in many cases cases still decades old. And so it's it's I think in many in many ways that this data explosion and and this the the transformation of business models and all of this that we've been talking about has just overwhelmed most IT organizations' ability to respond at least that quickly. So I, I would say most are getting it, but it's still a it's still a long um, a, a long road that they have to cover to kind of get in front of this, which is which is why companies like IHO Tahoe have a have a very significant role to play because I think smart organizations are now looking for ways, you know, they, they recognize the issue. They recognize this last point, right? That, that you, if I have the data and I can manage this complexity and I can apply it in ways that help me transform business models and create these, these, you know, breakout customer experiences and what have you, then, then I win and they, they're getting that. And so now they're, they're trying to find ways to address the issue and to deal with that. And, and that's really, I think, where it's coming to, and, and which is why, you know, the title of this thing is this idea of smart data discovery. Um, and, and I guess we're, we're you know, talk about it in a second, but it, it's, it's really about how do you create a mechanism to actually do all that? Um, and, and so that's, you know, I think they're getting it. And now it's about, you know, how do you put the pieces together? At, at a higher level, though, Charlie, when you say eight of every 10 or so organizations that you talk to are get it or are working on it, does that imply then that those companies that tried to adopt this technology, whatever this technology may be, be an AI, ML, or something else, for a strategic advantage, it's really no longer an advantage just keeping pace with everybody else? No, no, I don't. Well, I, I mean, in terms of it's not, I don't think it's the data management capability or the, the ability to manage complexity itself per se, right? It's. Um, so I, maybe the best way of saying this is that I am, um, I was interviewing um, the global CIO of Deloitte a couple of years ago for a, a TV show I was doing, and uh, I was kind of challenging him on um, systems that I felt were you know not sources of competitive advantage, and I said you know isn't that really the the driver? And he says, well I agree that you know our focus as an IT organization should be on those things that drive competitive advantage. He said, but there's also this issue of, of ensuring that we are focusing on those things that if we if we fail at them are going to provide competitive disadvantage. And in his case, he said, you know, their HR system was an example. Nobody did business with them because they had the best HR system, but their HR system enabled them to attract the best talent and to sustain and, and, and retain that talent or at least helped with that. And that 
avoided a competitive disadvantage. And so I think even to the extent that as organizations begin to recognize this issue and, you know, if everybody went out and, and you know, bought IO Tahoe and they had all of this and they had a whole bevy of tools to help them resolve this, that alone, you know, it's not going to undermine that advantage, right? It, it LA helps them com- from suffering from a competitive disadvantage, first and foremost. But secondly, it's then what do you do with that, right? It's about exposing that data and then how do I apply it? And then still then how you... How you apply it is what drives the differentiation and drives the value. But you can't apply it if you don't know what it is. If you don't, if you can't manage your data, if you can't find it, identify it, understand it, you can't possibly leverage it. So that's that's really where that comes from. And, and thank you again for mentioning IO Tahoe as we move forward. Um, the, when we move to this slide here, we see making the case for AI-powered data discovery. It is not all just sweetness and light, obviously. There are challenges to be faced. There are uh, problems as well as the promise. Can you go into that a bit? Yeah. So, I mean, look, I, I think, you know, what we've been talking about is that as you as you stare down this complexity, you, you stare down the importance, you, you recognize that self-service is going to be a critical aspect of this, that um, that you have to be able to manage across this complexity, you, you then have to ask, start asking yourself, well, then how do I do all of that? And, and you know, first of all, there's no single answer to that. You, you're going to need to employ a whole bunch of different strategies, platforms, tools, approaches, a whole bunch of things to do it. But I think that one of the first building blocks, kind of going just to reiterate what I said, is I can't begin to monetize data. I can't begin to leverage it to drive competitive value. I cannot begin to use it as an enabler of a transformed business model if I don't first understand what data I have, its relationship to other data I have, um, where it is, where it came from, you know, and, and there's, so, you know, this kind of falls as a banner of there's everything from data governance to um, data lineage and all these issues that surround the management of data. And so the basic premise is, and I think this is again where we're seeing where the positive, the correct use cases for AI and machine learning is that where do you find these points in which the human can't possibly manage this in the traditional ways any longer? And I think data management, data discovery is clearly one of those areas. There's just too much of it. I, 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 if I was running IT today, I could put a massive team on this and they still wouldn't be able to get their head around it. It's just growing too fast. There's all, all the things we've been talking about. And so this idea of using AI, and it's, it's somewhat ironic, actually, because AI requires data as its fuel, but then you can actually use AI as a way to manage the data itself. And, and so this idea of, of using AI-powered tools like IHOTA for data discovery to, to go and expose it and find it and then be able to manage it um, is critical. Now, the, the challenge, I think, um, and so this slide is sort of um, targeted at at maybe you're you're the uh, the data manager or you know you're not the the economic buyer you're not the person that can make this decision. Um, you have to I, I think you know going to some of what I was talking about earlier is that IT executives get this but they're not necessarily living it every day like you are and so you have to expose both the promise and the problems. You have to expose the gravity of the complexity issue. Um, but you then also have to talk about everything we just covered today about why getting this right is so critical. And it is a fundamental shift, obviously, in getting from here to there. And it is not a one-time journey. It has to be a continual re-examination, a continual where are we, where do we want to go next, and let's get there, then let's measure, lather, rinse, and repeat, if you will. Yeah, well, so so this quote, what got them here won't get them there, is actually a um, the title of a book by a guy by the name of Marshall Goldsmith, who I had the privilege to meet um, a couple of years back. And and the whole premise of this book, it was not an IT book. It was he's basically a a, a executive coach to some of the biz, b- biggest executives in the world, or you know, executives from some of the biggest companies in the world. And the whole premise is that that where he found as he was working with these executives, um, where he found the challenges is that they had often risen and as they had risen, they had built up this huge body of a a kind of experience of this is what works. And as they would get promoted further and further up, they were applying those practices. And the, the big lesson was that that ironically became the source of their problems because what got them there, what, what, you know, to that point that they were at 
wasn't going to get them to where they were then trying to take their organizations because there is either a shift in the market or there is just a shift in perspective because they were used to focusing on the specific area. And so the big message here is, is I think that as, as much as I said that enterprise executives are getting this, and they are, what they, they, they are still subject to this phenomena that what their history is sort of working against them, right? I, we all, all of us that, that I guess I said, I put myself in this category. We grew up in a time where we just weren't dealing with these issues. You know, I joke that sure, you know, back when I was running it, we had N tier architectures, but the N had a single digit in it. You know, today, these architectures and the interconnections between our applications and their online data streams is so ridiculously complex that nobody can sort it out. But, you know, I haven't had my hands on a keyboard really hands on in 15 years, and the average enterprise executive is in the same boat. It has been so long that we've had to actually deal with these issues that while we may get it conceptually and philosophically, we don't really understand it viscerally. And so, you know, if, if I'm making that case to an enterprise executive, you have to just kind of help them acknowledge that, that they don't really understand exactly how complex this is now and exactly how difficult of a problem this is to solve and exactly why you have to, apply, you know, employ these kind of tools that do something that we just can't do any other way. And so that's the big message here. It's, it's not about they're stupid. It's not about that they're, they don't want to spend the money or they don't get it. It's about that they're they're relying on this experiential base that is fundamentally out of step just because the entire environment has shifted so dramatically in the last decade or five years, really, that that their their experimental base is just out of line with our current reality. And, and it's just about helping them see that. But if they do get it, it sounds like you're saying that the prospects are, well, virtually limitless. Not only are they limitless, I, I think it is we are at a perfect point in time in that. The, the, so I, I write here, this is your moment, meaning speaking to someone who is helping drive this, but but really for the enterprise, the enterprise that gets this right now, that is able to do this. And, and you can pretty much look across the spectrum, any company that, that you see as as progressive and is, you know, uh, where you might hold up, you, you will find underneath them, they've got control of their data that that is the driver, one of the chief drivers of this, that those companies who get this, who are able to take massive amounts of data and manage it and leverage it and use it to transform experiences, to transform business models, to transform operating models, that it gives them flexibility, agility, that is, it's just a competitive differentiator that is, is at least right now, nothing else is going to beat that. And so this is the time to, to, you know, to still be at the front end of that curve. And, uh, and I'm really excited to see what people do with this because it's, it's going to get just amazing. And I can't think of a better way to basically end this conversation. So, Charlie, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, Charles Araujo, who is the principal analyst at Intellix, you've got a poster that you're offering folks. Am I right? Yeah, so so Intellix has produced, Jason actually built this uh, a little bit ago, um, so you can grab it there. It's a free download, and it kind of lays out all, you know, we, I told you we cover this huge spectrum of technology. It kind of lays them all out and how they're all interconnected, so it's a, a great tool. Hey, sounds very good. Charlie, thank you so much for being here. And, of course, folks, if you have any questions or want to make any comments, please join the conversation, hashtags AIML Data Discovery. Also, please list us at... Uh, at IO Tahoe, there will be no hyphen in the middle on it. So, again, for everybody, Charlie, thank you. I'm Steve Friedberg. Have yourself a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.